And if you will miss some part of it, don't be afraid. We will upload the session later on our YouTube channel and you can rewatch it whenever you want. Okay, so uh, Professor, the stage is yours, uh, please. Okay, thank you very much. And again, welcome to my kind of overview of the laboratory and research, mainly research I would like to present and glue including, of course, the data. And this picture, you know, already our nice school, beautiful outside, inside, which I definitely miss. And here some part I would like to talk about at the beginning, a little bit an overview about the immune system in general. Then I would show some data about so-called activity-based probes. So it's quite hardcore chemistry, but also how this kind of probes are used in biological samples to, in this case, visualize the proteolytic activity of enzyme of a specific enzyme, which I would like to introduce here. Then I would like to go over kind of a new device which is used in biochemistry, also in immunology called CYTOF. I will explain later on what it is. And the fourth and fifth part, I would like to show you some data which are related to SARS-2 or at least a little bit related to SARS-2 and COVID-19 research. And I will not show all the data because they are not published, but just in general, I give you a little bit an idea what we are working on. In general, the immune system, as we know, our or mammals, they have two parts, two arms, which are called innate immunity and adaptive one. And today I would also show a little bit data regarding the adaptive immune system, including B cells, and you also know when you think about COVID-19, how these antibodies are important, neutralizing antibodies, hopefully obtained after some vaccinations which are around. But don't forget, also the T cells or belongs to the adaptive immune system are important to respond against infection, not only antibodies. So also T cells are important. And when you look at the literature, mostly is focused regarding COVID-19 and SARS-2 here in this part, but the T-lymphocytes equally important. First of all, they are needed to activate or to help the helper cells or destroying infected cells by so-called T-killer cells. I would like to mention shortly about the innate immunity because the protease I'm focusing is actually derived from so-called neutrophils, like granulocytes, cells of the innate immune system. When they activate it, they secrete mediators, including proteases, at least four different proteases. And one of them I would like to focus is catepsin G. Here an overview, not the details, but going back to this neutrophil, here it's one neutrophil, plural neutrophils, they are secreting so-called NSP, neutral serine, neutrophil serine proteases, including, I think I can't see on this point, I'm surprised. Ah, okay, here it's written, yeah, now I see it, because it was actually here, mm, overlay of the camera, sorry. Okay, so neutrophil serine proteases, including NE, PR3, NSP4, and catepsin G. And today we would like to concentrate on the serine protease catepsin G. Here again, the T cells, here the T helper cells, then we'll talk about CD4 positive T cells or T killer cells, also called cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or more precisely CD8 positive T cells, and regulatory cells. So the T cells, which are CD4 C4 positive, they help the T helper cells. These cells, they kill cells, and the T regulatory cells are important to regulate the immune system after infection, and also that the T cells or other cells of the immune system are not causing harm when we think about hypersensitivity reaction, including autoimmunity. So tolerance T regulatory cells are also important. Catepsin G so far, 
as I mentioned, secreted mainly by neutrophils at the site of inflammation, which means when they are activated, they harbor, so this protease can actually harbor antimicrobial activity in a proteolytic dependent, which means digesting partly of the pathogen, proteins of the pathogen, or by just interacting with an arginine, so this amino acid, which is positively charged, which reach and interferes with the negatively charged bacteria surface and lysine. Also important catchy for regulation of chemotaxis in a proteolytic dependent manner. So in red, this is a little bit my past research or my research in the past. And what we found that catepsin G, this protease, is important for antigen processing in the MHC class two pathway. So the MHC, these are the molecules where antigens are presented, but before they can present it, they have to be processed. And so this is one of our work because it was not known before. People mostly using B cell lines and we start to use so-called primary B cells and radiic cells from the peripheral blood of a donator donor. Um, this was the advantage using primary cells and also this is important in general using primary cells again. And what we found also processing of antigen is quite dominated by this protease. And the last part, with how, how we could demonstrate how molecules which present antigenic peptides or MHC molecules are regulated by this catepsin G. So this is one part of our research. And also for now or in the future, I am doing basic research, of course, but also always it's interesting to have a patient material included. This is the second part. And the third part, if there is any possibility to establish, um, would say, or to fine tuning of a method or establish a new kind of method, I'm always interested. And so we were, as you see here in 2012, where we're using a so-called activity-based probe. What is it? There we go. We can simplify activity-based probe. In general, it's used to detect proteolytic activity. And if you have the upper part, the simplified one, the protease with the catalytic center and the reactive group interacts in a covalently manner for selectivity, different amino acids, selectivity means which kind of protease actually accept this kind of amino acids and the respective position and the detection here, the rich and attached. So in a more chemical way, these are phosphonates the warhead and the phosphonate can be attacked by the proteolytic activity, by the protease, in this case serine protease, the hydroxyl group of the serine amino acid attacks in a nucleophilic manner. The here phosphor atom shown here and as a result, a covalent bound. And for selectivity, you have your three amino acids, valine, proline, phenylalanine, a little bit of space we include for sensitivity manner and attached for detection of biotin. So this was actually the basics and was also published. So this is more detail here and you're interested in the chemical path. So then in just recently, so published last year, we thought about it's quite inconvenient having this biotin attached to the activity-based probe as demonstrated here. Again, you have the phosphonate here for selectivity, different amino acids, a little bit of spacer and biotin. And why not including the fluorophore or coupling, uh, attaching the fluorophore directly? And before I show you some data, Sometimes it's still fine to use this activity based probe because for extracellular detection, so we can use this in a Western blood based assay. However, on the cell surface of intact cells, you still come up with the streptavidin and then FITC in a kind of the flow sense, so activated cell sorting, so in flow cytometry. This can be used. However, there are some background when you come with streptavidin fit C. Nevertheless, we thought about when we're using the directly attached flow four, it might be less background. But for some reason, for extracellular detection of catepsin G, it is not suitable. We could not detect any cat G. And there might be a problem with this flow four attached on the cell surface. Also, you have to keep in mind 
intercellularly, the protease is, let's say, in the lysosome endosome, kind of in a soluble form. However, on the cell surface, it's attached to some molecules. And stasion, that might be the problem that this activity base probe with the fluor 4 can actually do this covalent bound. Anyway, Neville, as we see in here, in that in the next slide. So keep in mind, you can use this and then attaching streptavidine fit C or directly coupled, but not for cell surface. However, you can use this component for so-called gel electrophoresis or intracellularly, which I will show you later. The lower part, it's actually a control component without having the intact warhead. So this we used now, instead of doing the conventional Western blood-based assay, where you then incubate your activity-based probe with biotin, then SCS page, then you transfer it to a membrane where the proteins are immobilized and then visualize the proteolytic activity by using streptavidine and POD. And when we attach the fluor for directly, we can shorten this assay. You just do a SDS page, which means you, so first of all, you have catepsin G, the protease, and your activity base probe incubated, say for half an hour or an hour. And then you edit on this so called SDS page shell demonstrated here. And you see different wells, which are the samples. And then you run the gel. And later on, you just put this on a UV light demonstrated here and you see nice bands yeah, it could look like this here this is the control without a warhead and here the activity based probe directly conjugated to the fluor form and these are also experiments first of all i established this in a laboratory in poland in Wrocław, and it's now also established at nu and it's part of the so-called Biology 341 Biochemistry Laboratory. And so the students learn this. And what else? Comessi staining, because afterwards you can also stain your gel and to quantify. It's also a good loading control because sometimes when you load your samples, maybe some part will escape. Let's call it like in this way. And for loading control purposes, afterwards you can stain the gel with Gomesi and then you can detect whether you load in every sample or in every well the same amount. So this is also Gomesi staining is one of the part of this so-called activity-based uh, activity site label actually it's called by using activity-based probe. The other part can use PBMC, so these are cells from the peripheral blood, as you see here, blood donation, separation medium, you overlay the peripheral blood, centrifugation, roughly 20 minutes, and then you get here so-called intermediate phase or interface, and these are these cells, so immune cells, except conolocytes, they actually sediment in this lower part. And the PBMCs, you just can take them, wash them with PBS and do some analysis. So we did on the cell surface, I explained to you already with this label, it's fine. However, intracellularly, you could imagine when you permalize your cells and you add then the activity base probe with the biotin and then you add streptavidine fit C, then you have a huge amount of background and it's how it is. And then we thought at least our new or novel activity-based probe with the fluor form, fit C or also we can call it thumb. And we thought about maybe this is more suitable. Indeed it is. So just here in flow cytometry, just to remind you how it works. You have intact cells and they need, of course, the proteolytic activity, get G, that they are not absent, you have to, but you know this already. And then we add the sample and then with the fluor 4 can be detected with the laser and expressed as so-called in a dot plot manner. We summarized our data then in a bar diagram demonstrated here. You see CD4, we get it for CD4 positive T cells. They have active intracellular active catepsin G. These are the controls. So 
still have a little bit of a background, but this is okay. The same is true for CD8 positive cells. They have catepsin G. So maybe you ask, so what's new? First of all, that we can use this activity-based flow in flow cytometry, not only in cell cell surface, also now here intracellularly. And the second part is because as an immunologist always interested also about these immune cells, and this is also new, that CD positive, CD4 positive and CD8 positive have catepsin G. You could imagine when you try to publish this, that the reviewers they're interested is this proof of principle also right? Let's show it in a different way, whether these cells are really positive for catepsin G, and so we did. So this is now active site label, but in a Western blot-based assay. So we used these, or our Mars 116, so the activity-based probe with the biotin. Then the samples, how we get them, we use peripheral blood from human donor and isolated with uh, microbeads techniques called CD4 or CD8, and then lysis cells incubated with activity-based probe, and then went on the gel, transferred uh, to a PVDF membrane, immobilized there, and come up with streptavine POD, adding the substrate, and you just add an X-ray film where um, everywhere where you see the black bands, this are uh, catepsin G. And keep in mind, we always talk about the activity of the protease, not only protein, because it's not a Western blood, it's an active site label. And you see here, yes, CD4, different donors. So the number here, it's not when we did the experiment, you could imagine 1951, I was not born. And it's just how old the donor were. Because we are also interested whether there's any difference between younger donors and older. So we screened for 20, you could imagine quite a lot of work for the master student. Anyway, so you see here, everywhere now our beta acting control is not really the best, but it depends on the donor and it's also quite difficult then to isolate CD form. And even we checked the loading was precisely also by Comessi, but with the beta actin, some difference we, we don't know. But important is that catepsin G is present also in CD8 positive, uh, CD4 and CD8 positive. T cells, PBMCs, we use this as a control. Interesting, you see there's a difference in the size of CAT G, and this is also new. And we didn't expect that. And one reason could be that catepsin G, this is the normal variant, but the bigger one, this might, might be some catepsin G, which has a bigger form. Um, this could be a splice variant. And we think that this is part which are secreted. Maybe, so we discussed this, maybe for CD8 positive cells, for killing purposes, they have this protease intracellular and might be secreted, but we need to prove this. Unfortunately, of the pandemic now, focusing on SARS-2 and COVID-19, not on this project. Nevertheless, I would like to show you a little bit more T regulatory cells. This is also new, not only that we can use this activity-based probe, but also that a distinct subsets of T regulatory cells. They are called CD39 positive T Rex, that they have catepsin G more than the CD39 negative Rex. They are more for regulatory purposes here on the right side. This is also new, and we need to determine this in an active site label and that CD4, CD25, so T regulatory cells are positive for catepsin G. Okay, so I just want to finish up with this data, just would say recently published in 2020. And I would like now to go to the second part of research we are interested. Partly you saw we can perform this set in you, so-called active site label, the gel electrophoresis devices are definitely around at NU, not a problem. Comessi staining, not a problem. Flow cytometry, we don't have in our laboratory. And I share actually the laboratory with Trifa. I hope to get the flow sense microscopy soon. And of course, we can also use this activity based probe in flow sense um, microscopy. And so this will be also quite interesting and we planning already this collaboration. And since he's in the same laboratory, this is quite convenient. 
Okay, next part, flow cytometry by time of flight. What is this? Cytov, shortly called. So it's actually a combination of flow cytometry and mass spectrometry. So again, mass cytometry by time of flight. And this is the device, Cytov 2 already. And we use this at the University of Ulm in collaboration. And what's the advantage compared to general flow cytometry? So general flow cytometry, you're using floor four attached to the antibody or to the activity-based probe. In case of mass spectrometry by time of flight, so it's sight off, you're using so-called, here it come, elemental heavy metal isotopes. And these metals, they are conjugated to monoclonal antibodies. Now this is a difference. So antibody with the fluorophore and here you have a heavy metal. And heavy metal can be determined by mass spectrometry. What an advantage now, as you see, because when you have the fluorophore, you have kind of overlapping. So a spill over of the fluorophore and the detection one. And so you're quite limited with the samples we can adjust or can detect simultaneously. So in general for um, flow cytometry and the flow force, so when we used um, 16 color facts, that was quite a lot. Sometimes the problem overlapping and spear over of the flow form or that antibodies were not available, which the respective, which is with the respective flow form. So more than 16 I never did. Even newer fluorometer or cytometer, so I have cytometer, they can detect even more, but there's still a problem. However, using CYTOF 100 parameters in the same in the same approach is possible. For now, 42 parameters we see still quite a lot. It's around and used. So this is the method, and we did this in uh, the University of Ulm. And you see here, if your sample can also be PBMCs, like for the flow cytometry we've demonstrated before, and the single cell suspension are, suspensions are prepared from blood or tissue you see here from skin. And then you add the so-called metal labeled antibodies, so heavy metal or these are isotopes. You add them and then incubate them, and then you go to the site of device and cells are injected into an argon gas stream where they are exposed to plasma torch with a temperature about 10,000 Kelvin. And then actually the detection of course because the metals can be detected depending on the time, how long it takes how they fly in this vacuum. So time of flight mass spectrometry. And you see here then different peaks depending on the mass because every isotope has a different mass and this can be distinguished by mass spectrometry. And so this you can actually use by CYTOF. And also what is possible imaging. So you see here, but this we did not do yet because imaging in this case, which means that you also can look on intercellular different compartments where your protease for instance is localized. And this site of what device what we're using cannot do this. But site of in general here, the principle I explain. And so we did this, you need some controls, of course, that you have singlets and live cells. So it's detail is not important, but you see the analysis is quite complicated, including all the controls necessary, staining before cell fixation, fixation, discriminate, Live cells from dead cells is important, discriminate by single nucleated cells from doublets. So, and then others, you include then the cell surface markers, for instance, for CD4 positive T cells, and you're using CD4 recognizing antibody. Or in addition, what's new here, we used our activity based probe here again, but with biotin for the cell surface, not a problem. See here the intact cell with the catapsin G on the cell surface. Uh, here you can see then the 
peaks from the side of this is the control what does this mean so in addition we used an inhibitor not a different activity based probe without a phosphonate so without a warhead just add an inhibitor for catepsin g so pre-incubated and this is demonstrated in the left part so this is a protease selective for catepsin g and then we act um, at in the other sample then without the inhibitor and then both are treated then with the active site label active site activity based probe mass 116 biotin and then analyze the detection of different cells and then gated analyze and these are the data you see for b cells it's still difficult to detect catepsin g cd4 is also difficult but for neutrophils or eosinophils also kind of size definitely for neutrophils it is possible what does this mean so site of analysis in general it can be used activity-based probe first however there's still some fine tubing necessary because cd8 and cd4 they have cat g also b cells and nk cells so with this is it's still we are working on that but it's the first one of the first paper because one month later other paper came out from a group from the united states and poland they publish also activity-based probe but they include already so this is more advanced for detection of the proteolytic activity they include the heavy metal into the inhibitor in our case we have the activity-based probe and then biotin and come with the streptavidin and then the isotope so more advanced but still we are on the level first described that it's possible to detect active proteases with cytop okay then this is actually part with cytop since we do not have the site of nu a little bit problematic to do and establish this here but the advantage is when i think about phd students that I talked to my collaboration partners in Ulm. And if I have a PhD candidate, partly can be done at the University of Ulm. But one problem is that the students they start a PhD program first for one year going over the, all the lectures and exams. So it takes quite a while and they're ready for starting in the laboratory, right? However, it is possible then doing part of a PhD program that in NU and in Germany if possible. And so this is one other laboratory. This is now immunology laboratory. I went also in Ulm, this is Professor Schirmbeck and the other professor was Professor Knipschild and Fabian Gärtner who did the experiment with Seitov and he's also, or both are willing to train the students also there. Another laboratory here in Ulm, immunology laboratory again, Professor Schirmbeck, and we were in this is laboratory and did some experiment with so-called CAMOSTAT. What is CAMOSTAT? CAMOSTAT is an inhibitor. As you see here, this is the vial. CAMOSTAT, I tried to get this in you and last year it was really difficult to get this CAMOSTAT. Why? Because there's a publication around in spring in cell demonstrating that Camostat inhibit the infection by SARS-CoV-2. However, I was interested whether Camostat also inhibits other proteases because it was shown it inhibits so-called transmembrane protease serine 2 which is important for SARS-CoV-2 to enter the cell because the trimere of the S protein has to be primed, digested, that the fusion peptide will be available and is inserted into the target cell and virus can enter. And so I was interested whether Camostat inhibits catepsin G. You might ask why is this important? Because when you think about the severe cases in COVID-19 or even critical cases and then it ventilators, then this protease like catepsin G is one of the serine proteases involved in some complications in 
COVID-19, when you think there's no direct, direct proof, but when you think about thrombosis, et cetera, the proteases are involved and in including catepsin gene. And so I thought maybe it's also interesting why or whether Camostat might inhibit CATG. So the experiment and using the active site label method, uh, titrating different amounts of Camostat. And you see here, thousand micromolar that's more more than you should actually add as an inhibitor so if an inhibitor is good proteolytic inhibitor or protease inhibitor then we talk about 10 uh, micromolar then it's quite a good inhibitor more selective when we go down to the nanomolar range and you see here definitely we have cat chi and different amount of camostat that camostat does not inhibit cat chi here you have the control so it's an inhibitor for CAT-G and other inhibitor, reversible, irreversible inhibitor. DMSO has a control because Camostat is solved in DMSO. Other method is here is shown here, 96 well by well, 96 well well, and doing a flow, uh, in this case, a colorimetric substrate and determine the turnover of this colorimetric substrate by CAT-G and checking whether the camostat, this camostat is inhibiting. And in this method, it's inhibited slightly in very high concentration. So it's still possible. What's the difference? Why we see here no inhibition, here we see some inhibition. You know, first of all, you see how important it is using at least two or even more methods to determine and to prove your conclusion. Why well, here's the difference because the active site label method and the activity based probe binds quite strong. So you need a very good inhibitor to prevent that compared to the colorimetric substrate shown here. So come on, start not suitable to inhibit cat G. The last part I would demonstrate you now some data which I performed at the University of Tübingen. Tübingen it's also in Germany, also in the south, but the difference tubing is an old university town, university roughly 500 years old. And you can, when you're in the, actually in the city, you think about you're in the middle age and quite interesting. I would say not really city, town, small 80,000 inhabitants, most of them are students. And one of the laboratory in the past that did my masters and PhD and later on a little bit postdoc and as we were coming back we became friends Professor Dr. Kalbacher in his laboratory is a biochemical laboratory and we were interested you see here on SARS-2 and on the left side you have SARS-1 this is uh, the homo trimer of the S protein here you have SARS-2 with the homo trimer and then you see here some sticking out molecules, right? So this is actually another molecule. This is part of this called loop. So activating loop. This is here demonstrated more precisely. Here the activating loop of SARS-1 and here the activating loop longer yeah, and more exposed by SARS-2. And this activating loop is important for being activated for fusion within the cell membrane of the host cell. Why? See here on the lower part is the S1, S2 side or interface it's also called and it has to be digested. If this is not the case, then the entrance is prevented. And why can this be actually performed? Cause the host protease on the cell surface of the target cell, so the so-called transmembrane protease serine 2 digests the interface here after an amino acid called arginine on the P, so-called P1 position, P1 prime position you have as serine. And so this cleavage site is important. And you see also already the difference between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Here something is missing. So the polybasic sequence or insert, it's this also called for SARS-2. And these are quite interesting, we thought, and whether it's digested also by other proteases, we were interested. And you could imagine, looks different here compared to here. 
So there might be a possibility also not only on the sequence, but also the accessible for the proteas. So one problem we face using the intact as protein. So we try this first. So in collaboration with the biology department working on HIV research previously and how they also switched since over ah, almost a year, I would say, on SARS-2 research. And they, they transmitted, inactivated, of course, SARS-2 with the mutant, without the mutant. There was already interest in on this specific mutant. It was around already in springtime. And we were interested to digest it as protein by different proteases. However, it was not possible. Later on, we discussed and we found the problem was when they took the supernatant and uh, the medium, the cells are cultured with the virus, there are some yeah, serum proteins, let's say it in this way, included, which is needed for cell culture, and they have a serum protease inhibitor. So we could not use that. One problem we faced. The other problem to get the recombinant part, mostly the interesting part, the polybasic part, is not actually expressed. So also this is the next problem. Then we came up with the idea, why not using just a peptide? Because peptide synthesis is not a problem. So we did. There we go. You see here the sequence of SARS-1 peptide of the activating loop and analyzed here in the biochemical laboratory in the, at the University of Tübingen. This is actually a special center. It's called, so kind of MNF stands for, just an independent institute, but also belongs uh, to the University of Tübingen. You see also the devices are quite old. Yes, they are from the 70s. The laboratory is quite around for a while, the devices, 70s, 80s, but, really precise and he also my, my friend um, professor kalbach he has also a new device hplc and everything is fancy fancy but this is the best gives the nice solution as you see here one nice peak so this is the peptide out of the synthesis after synthesis we don't trust the synthesis so we purify again by hplc and then localize the sample and then we can do the so-called, in this phase, anti-chain processing of the SARS-2 activating loop demonstrated here. And you see, so again, quite pure. What are these peaks here at the beginning? This is just buffer on PBS. And the next slide, you see, you use trypsin. And trypsin, like transmembrane protease serine 2, digests after arginine. So between R and S, trypsin digest, not surprised. Interesting is the trypsin of SARS-2 peptide, this activating loop, digest for them, but you're not surprised after other arginines because other trypsin prefers arginine and also lysine at the P1 position. You also used other proteases which we are interested, but we would like to show this data when it's published. Okay, so far, as you see, I would say of might be a problem, but HPLC and antigen processing studies, this can be done also at NASA Bayef University. And I don't know, but the chemistry laboratory, maybe there's a possibility to use HPLC. And would like to finalize here in conclusion, so a new activity-based probe important to detect Kachi intercellularly. We saw that the activity-based probe is also suitable by using the new methodology CYTOF. Kamostat does not inhibit Kachi. And the cleavage site of the so-called proteolytic sensitive activation loop of SARS is determined. And so also we just submit this paper last week. And I hope even it's a small story I hope it will be accepted soon. So this is the team so far. You know this picture, of course. This is the University of Tübingen collaboration, Dr. Professor Kalbacher. Here, the University of Ulm, Professor Knipschild and Schirmbeck, really helpful. And my former 
show some data from Schroeder to include it in this manuscript. And here, a small T and now, as you see here, an RA, research assistant, working and also helping with publication. So far, thank you very much for listening. And I think the panel might be open for discussion. Okay, thank you, Professor, very much. It was an interesting uh, presentation to hear. So for now, let's conduct a short Q&A session. So if anyone has some questions, you're free to ask. Uh, you can use your microphone or you can just type in the chat. Uh, during the session here, we had the one question. So it's, yeah. uh, can you explain the difference between CD39 plus and CD39 minus? For the T regulatory cells. So this is just briefly shown. I didn't want to make it too complicated. And for the term of T regulatory cells, you have to use um, panel of different markers. First of all, CD4, that you're checking for CD4 positive T cells. Then you look for CD25, it's an additional marker for T regulatory cells, and especially the high expression of CD25. Then in the next step, you or we looked on CD134 and CD39 and catepsin G. And this panel we used that we do not have to actually using FOXP3. FOXP3 is another marker for T regulatory cells, but only in mouse. In human, also FOXP3 positive cells are found which do not have any regulatory capacity. So, and so far, what we know is that CD39 T regulatory cells demonstrated here, so it's a marker for T reg cells, they have more regulatory capacity compared to the CD39 minus. They are still T-Rex because they are positive for CD4 and CD25. There's still also CD25 high. So it's, it's two different subsets. Their precise function, it's, it's not clear. The discussion so far that these have more regulatory capacity. Other, other yeah, I have. Um, if I want to do some research in, in this field, so what should yeah. I do? I'm now a first year student. First year? Yes. So what, what I have in mind for PhD students. So it takes a while, right? So this is actually the, the goal, PhD student. Or what I have now, I have a um, three or fourth year student and they are research assistant. And it's also possible to come in the laboratory and do some experiments. Or we offer also this biology 341 bio, biochemistry and laboratory where the students can be trained in different methods. And this laboratory teaching, I do it just together with Professor Xi. And this is also a possibility. And fortunately, we have a, only a capacity of 16 students. Okay, thank you for the question. I think here we have another question from Jean Erke, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for the lecture. Uh, yeah, hello. I have a question uh, regarding the activity-based probes, I guess. Yeah. On the first part, you said that uh, there were like two probes, Mars uh, 116, and one was with biotin, and the next one was with FAM. Yeah. Yes, like, uh, why is FAM better than biotin? I just didn't get the point. And did mm -hmm. you use biotin at all? Like, was it used in research? So in, in the past, we, we started with the biotin attached, and yeah, we were not interested to use the activity-based probe in flow cytometry. 
and we just used this mass biotin in a Western blot-based assay. And you could also imagine when you have a biotin and you come with streptavidin, it's more sensitive. You can detect less amount of catepsin G in a Western blot-based assay. This is the advantage. This is the first part. And the other part I tried this mass 116 biotin in flow cytometry, even when I was already, when I just came back from the US in Germany, but it didn't work in flow cytometry. And also I didn't have so much time. And later on in 2016, it's quite, also already a quite time ago. And there uh, asked the student just try everything, you know, all the controls and different buffers. And, and she was successful to determine catepsin G on the cell surface. But we knew already in this time, she also used this biotin for intracellular staining that it does not work because streptavidin binds unspecifically to biotin related proteins. And intracellular, they are. Extracellular, we were lucky. Nevertheless, also for extracellular staining with this biotinylated activity-based probe, you always included an inhibitor for CAT-G as a control. So then the reduction of activity, this is precisely the activity which we determined. So the advantage now to attach thumb is that intracellularly it works. And as a surprise, because we thought we will simplify the method. First of all, we don't need streptavidine and FITC anymore. However, we found out on the cell surface, it does not work. And as I said, there might be that the protease is interacting, not, is, is of course, bound on the cell surface somehow. And maybe the catalytic center is sterilically hindered and that with the fluorophore, it does not interact and bind them with the catalytic center. This is the only explanation what we have so far. But we also did not follow this so much. We thought, okay, for extracellular staining, we use the biotinylated one and intracellularly the, the thumb and that's it. Let's go further. Especially when you see what we found, we were interested, especially now after hopefully the pandemic ends soon, sooner better than later, right? That we can find why or why is catepsin G on the cell surface and what does it do? So the function, yeah. So, and also the advantage, this thumb for intracellular staining, when you think about fluorescence microscopy, it's suitable. I did this experiment already. That's possible, you can visualize that. And I'm looking forward to have this fancy um, fluor fluorescence microscope tree thumb, and then we can use this also in this method. Okay, thanks for the question, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now Thank you. Clear. So, biotin for yeah. extracellular and farm for intracellular, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, in, in actually, in case when you're looking for intact cells, if you have a cell site, like for Western blood or SDS page, then you can use both. However, keep in mind that the mass biotin is more sensitive. So what does it mean? In a Western blood-based approach, you need less catch which can be visualized. For instance, when you only have a small amount of cell isolate from primary human cells or cancer cells, uh, with cancer cells you might have maybe quite enough. However, when you just have a small amount of cells and then you take out this order to make a cell isolate, I mean, if this is limited, then definitely the biotinylated one is better compared to the directly conjugated with them. Okay. Okay, if anyone has a, also questions, please use the chat or microphone. Um, sorry, I yeah. um, have a question on, uh, I didn't quite get how um, exactly um, 
how exactly uh, carapsin G is connected to treating COVID-19 because uh, oh. <laughs> I, 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 I did some pre research before the lecture. Yeah. And uh, I, from what I found, it um, COVID nineteen um, might invade the cells through um, a certain extracellular pro protein that helps uh, the uh, protease that cleaves it in order to, for it to enter the cell and. Uh, oh. Catepsin is um, a part of, uh, is one of the um, compounds that regulate the uh, activity of this protease, but uh, he didn't specify what kind of, what kind of catepsin it was. And uh, mm -hmm. frankly, I'm yeah. Yeah, the, yes, not very it, familiar with the topic. And a bit confused yeah, so why. this is right about catepsin G and being involved in COVID-19. It's just the outcome, the, the disease, when you think about, I mentioned thrombosis and cardiovascular problems, and it's found that proteases, serine proteases are also involved and in mouse model or rat model, or animal models, they could show when they're using the inhibitor and they could prevent, can prevent cardiovascular diseases or thrombosis and so in this case, the catepsin G and connected to COVID-19, only when you think about the outcome of the disease. So catepsin G has nothing to do with the entrance of the virus into the host cell. And this, this, this is what, what I found. found. So, so catepsin G does not prime the spike protein. Which I thought, because when you think about uh, polybasic insert and calcium G digest after arginine, you would expect a catchy. So that's not true. In case of COVID-19, makes sense. Also, when you think about a cytokine storm, and proteases are also involved in cytokine regulation, including catchy. So let's say. Catepsin G is indirectly involved in COVID-19. Let's say it in this way. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have another question from Olga, please. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me well? I hear you very well. Uh, thank you very much for this time. Sorry, it's my daughter. Okay, hello. I'm, actually, I'm not I'm not so close to biochemistry or else, but it was just my interest to see to to participate in this virtual course. Thank you very much. So I'm actually to be honest, I'm far from this kind of time, but I would like to due to my some of my personal backgrounds, I would like to ask one question about the uh, immune system and about the lymphocytes, uh, especially about, I have, I have been reading some material, some articles about the possibility to use the lymphocytes of nat natural cures or T lymphocytes, I'm not sure, uh, to, be dedicated, to be dedicated for the treatment of oncology. But it was written there that it is not very easy. It is very difficult to collect or to accumulate a proper quantity of these cells from a human body. Why? And if, if it, is it possible in laboratory or why, why it is difficult or why it is, it, is it expensive? Why, why are it, is it difficult? Okay, thanks for the question. Did I understand you in the right... Did I understand you? Sorry. Huh? Sorry. Sorry if my question is stupid or naive. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I just want to ask you did I understand in case cells, natural killer cells? Yes. Okay. So can you see the picture? These are in case yes. cells. So for everybody who's listening, 
these are in case cells. Here is a cartoon. And in case cells, they are used for anti cancer therapy. And why is it so difficult? The problem is that in the past, they started with using kind of cell lines of NK cells, and they were not really successful. Better is to use primary cells. Um, why this is such a problem using primary cells? Actually, when you isolate NK cells, you get quite a big amount of NK cells from a blood donation, let's call it like this. So when we use NK cells from the peripheral blood, it's called Buffy coat. It's half a liter of blood donation. So this case is not a problem. But in case of the patients, you have to work with smaller amount, but still the smaller amount in K cells should not be a problem. Dendritic cells, it's a problem. To get primary dendritic cells from the peripheral blood, because you have really is only a small amount of them. So this is one part. The other part, which I know from own experience working on glioblastoma, when they're using NK cells, ex vivo, and stimulate them with IL-2, it's a cytokine, and back to the patient, actually it did not help to cure the glioblastoma patient. So it also depends on the patient, of course, but also on the kind of cancer. So using NK cells, for treatment, it's quite promising. Yes, I agree. They have also not only in the T cell level, also using in case cell, the so called CAR, C A R, in case cells, immunotherapy. So you can, for cancer therapy, you can use T cell immunotherapy or in K cell, T K cell immunotherapy. And it is mostly. I would say it works fine in C2, but when it comes to a patient, it's always a problem. So for patients, it is always a problem because of the individual immune system or, or why? Some, it depends on some individual characteristic of the patient's organ or the patient's body. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I some individual react different than others, and this is all, unfortunately always not a problem. Also, when you think about COVID nineteen, some of them nothing, some of them mild, some of them kind of yeah moderate, others severe, and even critical. So that patients react different about this therapy. And also I'm, I'm working now in a in case cell review, in case cell which are used for therapy. And when we now go to, go to the literature, it looks always promising, promising, promising. But when it comes to the patient, then I always see these question marks, unfortunately. Thank you very much. For yeah, the thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, if you have some questions left, please ask. If not, uh, I think from this point we can finish the session. Yeah, we can wait for, for a few minutes. Okay. Is there any other left to us? Okay, it seems like there are no questions left. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Burster, for this amazing presentation. You're uh, very welcome. Thank you very much for the interest and listening. I hope it was clear. So it's just giving your impression a little bit from past. Also demonstrate you partly what is possible at NU, what we can do. And the other part, what is also possible to do upload. And I understand PhD, so you're more on the level of undergraduates, but this is definitely so some projects for PhD, when also partly go upload.
because when I talked to Professor Schimbeck, he said um, at least I should come for a few months or half a year uh, if possible. And so more suitable for PhD. But when you think about students um, working in the laboratory, there's always some possibility. I hope for, hopefully after the pandemic, it's easier also to have access on the laboratory and do some experiments. And so would like to close with this. Okay, thank you very much again. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you, you too. Bye. So, thank you. Bye. A few bye. final words, guys. So, we, if you had some internet problems during the session, uh, in a few days we will send the recording of the session. Uh, we will upload it on the YouTube, and you can rewatch it if you want, or you can share it with friends, share it with colleagues, etc. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this session. And guys, if you are interested, tomorrow we have another session with the Professor uh, Darhan Utep Birgenov. Uh, he will talk about biochemistry, protein chemistry, uh, protein tags, bioanalytics, protein x-ray, and many more things. Uh, feel free to join uh, tomorrow at 6 o'clock. We will also share the Zoom link with you in our uh, pages on Instagram, on Telegram, and by the email. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Professor, for the great presentation. I hope uh, you all enjoyed it. Thank you for coming and stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay.